Bulgaria lies between Greece and Romania. In 1941, we held aerodromes in Greece, and to bomb Ploeste would have meant flying over neutral territory. King Boris agreed to keep out of the war if we respected Bulgaria's neutrality. We kept our promise. But already Boris was flirting with Hitler. Filov, his prime minister, was sent to Birch's garden to see the Führer and his valley Ribbentrop. Filov had prepared the way, and Boris soon followed his minister, being met at the station by the Führer himself. And like his father in the last war, he betrays his people. In Sofia, all is ready to receive the Nazi hordes. Boris's work has been well done, Mussolini's adventures saved. The fate of Greece is sealed, her airfields lost to us, and Proeste free to continue producing oil. In the meantime, our armies had met with success in Africa, and Benghazi now became the focal point from which an attack could be launched. Here you see liberators manned by Americans preparing for the raid. More and more was being demanded from Vassal Boris, and the royal dictator was worried. Every day sabotage and unrest became more apparent. Sympathy for Russia among his people increased. After his last visit to Hitler, he returned with a mysterious illness that resulted in his death. The crews manning the liberators knew full well the importance of this task. At last Ploeste, Germany's main source of natural oil, was the target. The bomber boys of the RAF had already severely crippled Hitler's synthetic petroleum centers, so oil became a vital problem. Oil that he needs for his U-boats fighting a hopeless battle under the seas. Oil for the air fleets of the already badly wounded Luftwaffe. Oil for his armies desperately battling against annihilation in Russia and elsewhere. Here is the target housing the great refineries of Stiada Romna, Creditormina, and Colombia. The majority of this oil goes to Germany. Lorry after lorry loads its precious cargo, ultimately to find its way wherever the Axis forces are engaged with the United Nations. The Liberators had no easy journey, a trip of some 1,400 miles. The crews knew of the risks involved and expected heavy losses. Their training had been long and strenuous. They carried the attack home. The first bombs are about to fall. Illusions and hopes will vanish in smoke. Today from neutral sources, we know that of the three great plants, one is wholly unworkable, while the other two can only do so at greatly reduced capacity. Huge conflagrations mirror the enormous tragedy of lives woven by this, the greatest criminal in history. His soldiers may seek to quench those fires, but in vain, for they shall not cease to glow until the last vestige of everything that spells Nazi or master race is eliminated from the world forever. So began the story of Ploeste. First the hurricane, and now the spitfire becomes a maid of all work. The latest pictures of the world's finest fighter shows her adapted for close support shallow dive bombing. In its new form, carrying one 250-pound bomb and four cannons, the Spitfire becomes an additional threat to Axis transport, supply dumps and shipping. As yet, a South African wing composed entirely of South African pilots is the only one using these new Spit fighter bombers. They have been carrying out great work both on the 8th Army front and across the Adriatic Sea into Yugoslavia. occupied China. It is seldom that the name gorilla is absent from the front page of newspapers. 
Today, the gorilla is a patriot who, until the arrival of the United Nations, is keeping alive the spirit of his country. Chinese gorillas are responsible for this act of sabotage. A bridge dynamited, a train loaded with soldiers and arms wrecked a hundred feet below. Not often do we see pictures from Japan, but these same ones were used by that country to gain sympathy from a German audience. Now, they're again producing sympathy, this time for the courage of a people who have, in six years of horror, never wavered in their determination to rid themselves of the Japanese scourge. A film typifying German humour shows French prisoners of war compelled to remove sandbags from monuments in their capital. Such was the German confidence in victory when these pictures were taken. Just glance at the faces of these men from all parts of the French Empire. No mercy was shown to them. No mercy will be shown by them when the time comes. And that is drawing nearer. Berlin. Give all your metal belongings to the German factories for Hitler's birthday. Your Führer thanks you. So run posters to be seen all over Germany. It is interesting to see that after stripping Europe, the German people have now to give up their personal belongings. Perhaps the master race realized their Führer's intuition is no longer a sound business proposition. But while Adolf is still in a position to make a request, perhaps it is wiser to carry it out. In 1938, the British public first heard of the Lockheed Hudson. Today we learn that this aircraft is going into honorable retirement. In four years of war, the Hudsons have been everywhere, seen everything and done everything. They have fought with fighters, bombed, depth charged, patrolled, photographed, ferried and even trained. They came to our help in the early days when aircraft were none too plentiful. And in most of the great achievements of coastal command, Hudsons played a leading part. Perhaps the most famous exploit in their long and brilliant career was performed early in the war, when one of these aircraft depth charged a German U-boat and forced it to the surface, receiving the surrender of the entire crew. The submarine was the first to be captured from the air and was later brought into a British port, giving us much valuable information. Let us pay a tribute to this gallant little aircraft which had it not been for the British mission that visited the United States in the spring of 1938, might still have been a harmless commercial transport, the Lockheed B-14. <laughs> this being a world war, even the remote jungle of Africa has not escaped its impact. At a time when our supply lines in the Mediterranean were challenged, it became increasingly necessary to construct airfields with the aid of the natives. They were miracles of swift construction. Today, modern airfields may be found in storybook settings, vital outposts of an immense world strategy. Most of these natives rarely saw a motor car. Nowadays, a flight of hurricanes or bombers is a commonplace. The aircraft are shipped to West Africa in crates, after which they are assembled and given a test flight before being flown across the continent to the battlefront.
great hawser glider, fully laden with troops, comes in at a steep angle. The nose buried itself two or three feet deep in the tree. But miraculously, the only casualty was the pilot who suffered a broken ankle. He seemed quite cheerful as he was put aboard an ambulance and sent to hospital. These young Polish boys, at present training with an RAF apprentice wing, were evacuated from eastern Poland to Russia in 1941. After an agreement between the two countries, they were sent to Persia and recently came to this country. Practically all of these lads are without father or mother. But here in this country, British families have taken kindly to them and all have a wide choice for their holidays. Each boy has been adopted by Polish fighter or bomber squadrons and the keenness they have shown in everything to do with their training indicates their future with units of the Polish Air Force. In 79 AD, the eruption of Vesuvius brought one of the worst natural catastrophes since the world came into existence. Pompeii, one of the most civilized and modern built cities of its time, was completely destroyed. Here are the remains of that Roman civilization. Today, Nature has been exceeded by a human catastrophe. This time, only the ruins and symbols of the past efforts of man were untouched. Before the war, we used to spend pounds and pounds to be able to admire the survivals of the past. Nowadays, it's being done on a mere half a crown a day. Many an air crew has had experience of this, a drift in an open rubber dinghy. Now, however, they'll no longer have to face the fury of the sea, for a new kind of lifeboat has been perfected, affording both cover and means of propulsion. The Wellington in the picture drops the latest model, which attached to three parachutes glides gracefully to earth. On hitting the water, the lifeboat blows itself up very shortly the rescued men were able to get aboard. If the weather is reasonable and they have a long distance to go, a mast is positioned and sail set. And so another lifesaver, product of untiring patience, becomes a reality and a comfort to all. fell, a brave little band of Haramen escaping in small fishing boats made their way across the Mediterranean to join the Allied forces in the Middle East. Ever since they have been carrying out regular sorties alongside the Royal Air Force. Wherever they may find themselves, our Greek allies keep alive their national customs. 
and their traditional gaiety of Greek dances accompanies the roasting and eating of the Paschal lamb. The Royal Hellenic Air Force is small in numbers but great in spirit, steeled as it is by the memories of the tragedy which overran their country. They remember Greece, and we remember too.